Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and uh, we're in conversation with the new CEO of Cognizant, uh, Ravi Kumar. Ravi, thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 and uh, congratulations on taking over in January. It's been about four months and it's been quite a trial by fire, I would say, not just for you, but for the tech uh, business in general at this point in time. Uh, take me through what the last four months has been for you like. Thank you, Shireen, for coming over to our Hudson office at uh, Cognizant and uh, excited to see you after a long time. Yeah, so uh, I joined in January. Um, it's been uh, a great time. I know uh, I've uh, gone back to the archives of the company, the history of the company. You can learn a lot out of, out of it. Uh, there are three things which kind of resonated about what Cognizant is. Cognizant is a very young company. It's only 25 years old roots in India. In fact, you turned 25 literally this, this, this month. month. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we are listed for 25 years this month. And uh, deep roots in India. We are the second largest employer in India in our tech services space and probably the most invested American firm in, in India. We have 260,000 employees. The three things which stuck to me uh, as um, I curated my insights I think Cognizant has a growth mindset, mm. so I want to make sure that we accelerate and create growth momentum inside the firm. The second is it has a founder's mentality and an entrepreneurial spirit, mm. uh, and that's the reason why Cognizant has been so fast growing. And the third, I would say, is uh, client centricity and uh, the flexibility uh, and the ability to co-create with clients. Mm. When Cognizant was born in 1996 to 1998, it was the tail end of the Y2K boom. And it was actually the dot-com burst. Mm. And that time, as it was getting built, it was built for the next generation of technology coming in, which is application outsourcing. And the dot-com burst was important because it left a lot of telecom infrastructure freely available. So you could do more things beyond Y2K. So Cognizant built the entire value proposition on a confluence of technology and industry, mm. flexibility and uh, co-creation with clients, and a huge entrepreneurial spirit. These three, if I can curate it mm. and I can uh, catalyze the heritage, I think we have a winning combination. You know, so speaking of catalyzing the heritage to ensure that it is a winning combination, what is it going to mean in terms of tangible next steps now? Uh, you have, uh, you know, you've already started to address that. The expectation is that with some of the measures that you've taken, you will be able to arrest the market share decline as well as grow market share. You're also in the market to add uh, to your large deals. Uh, we've started to see some movement on that front. What is the winning strategy going to look like in terms of tangible next steps? So, uh, so Shireen, you know, the first quarter, uh, which uh, first earnings which I actually uh, had for me, uh, we had 28% increase in bookings, Y and Y. 30% of uh, those bookings came from large deals. So we've created a lot of outreach on large deals. And we've created a lot of infrastructure inside the company to cater to those large deals. So I'm very confident that that runway is going to work. So 100, are, million, 100 million kind of deals, so, what could the pipeline so look like than, potentially? More than 50 million TCV is what a large deal is. And 30% of our bookings last quarter was that. And 28% I had an increase in bookings. It's, it's only my first quarter, so I'm building the runway for the future. Because whatever bookings we do now will give us opportunities with backloaded revenues. The second is we want to be an employer of choice. Uh, we are a big employer in India. We want to be an employer of choice. Our attrition rates have started to fall mm. since From the last... From 30% down to about 23% It's now. fallen last quarter, and the trend is looking good. So uh, how, where do you believe your... You know, could um, be? You know uh, uh, the, the quarter is still on, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm tracking that number very effectively. We are a company deeply believe... We deeply believe that we could be an employer of choice, and there are multiple things we do well. You know, we create global mobility for our employees in India. In fact, uh, we are one of the biggest platforms for global mobility in India. Uh, we hire from schools and build careers with inward mobility, internal mobility for our employees mm -hmm. who can traverse the capability value chain and, and get global opportunities. We had a big learning infrastructure. 25 million hours of learning happened in our, on our platform mm -hmm. last year. We are also a very purposeful platform. Back in India, 40,000 of our associates spent almost 200,000 hours 
on uh, uh, on uh, community work mm. on reskilling mm. so there are a whole bunch of exceptionally good employee value proposition levers which uh, which uh, actually hold for cognizant as a company mm. we're very entrepreneurial that gives ability for our uh, employees to explore more in fact uh, i launched a initiative called blue bolt which is a initiative around grassroots innovation mm -hmm. And we want the 350,000 plus employees of Cognizant to incrementally explore more things mm. beyond doing project work. Mm. Uh, the third, which is what I did in my uh, in my uh, earnings, is uh, have operational discipline and simplify our operations. So mm. what I did was I announced a program called Next Generation, right. where I'm taking out cost. Yeah, and uh, I'm actually transitioning my real estate to tier two cities in India so that structurally I can transfer those savings back to growth infrastructure and catalyze growth and if I catalyze growth mm. growth is the panacea for all problems mm. I think it will have an operating uh, impact on my margins as well so mm. I kind of created the whole uh, I would say playbook uh, of course the market is very uncertain mm. Some sectors are continuing to be very soft. Is it, is it looking is very worse soft. Than, than May? Because in May you said that you were seeing clients holding back. You were seeing clients holding back on discretionary spends. Uh, the uh, you know environment was looking soft. Uh, do you continue to see that revenue softness? You know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know. The, there's no change in my narrative since what I have said in May. Uh, some sectors are. Uh, uh, impacted or discretionary spend and it's also falling off the cliff in, in some places financial services financial services is the is the sector of course we have a huge presence in healthcare in fact our healthcare economy is one of the largest in the world between healthcare health, health equipment devices life sciences we are the biggest provider that is resilient to economic cycles mm -hmm. so that's an advantage we have but overall i'm seeing a lot of large deals large deals come in two swim lanes shareen one is cost takeout efficiencies and vendor consolidation mm. those deals are actually more active when the economic cycles are soft mm. and we're seeing more of that then there are transformational deals which come with discretionary spend they are much more softer we're seeing less of them mm. hopefully they, we, we can transition to them over a period of time the smaller deals which are discretionary spend is very soft so I think this is how the uh, market is evolving mm. and I'm hoping that uh, the progress we made so far, as well as what 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 we are planning to do for the future, I'm very hopeful that we could uh, bring back the growth uh, growth mindset of well, Congress. By, by when do you believe that you will be able to get closer to your peers, if not on par with your peers uh, in terms of growth? It's hard to uh, you know s say uh, when it would be, but uh, what I'm certain is, uh, bookings momentum, as uh, as I said in the first quarter. Uh, with a healthy pipeline is looking good. I think it's a virtuous self-reinforcing mm. cycle of uh, employees and clients. I mean, we all think demand is what is needed, but you need a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle of employees and clients. If your employees stay with you, your clients come to you. If mm. your clients stay with you, your employees come to you. <laughs> if you're on that cycle, it's an easy business. If you're not on that cycle, it's a hard business. Positions, because as part of your winning strategy, uh, is that likely to be a big driver as well? You've done about four <coughs> recently. How uh, big of an emphasis is that going to be? So, you know, uh, our capital allocation policy has been stated to do acquisitions. In fact, 50% of my free cash we use for acquisitions. That's the stated policy. Uh, I have not changed that policy. I think acquisitions have contributed well to digital capabilities and gaps which we had. And we've always used that as a way to fill the gaps. I'm going to continue to look for meaningful, purposeful acquisitions, which will continue to give us acceleration. Um, you know, the ones we did were, you know, the last one I did was a mobility asset. Uh, Cognizant, as, as it built its... Uh, uh, value proposition on a confluence of industry and technology and I told you how mm. the heritage is mm. um, we also actually are a big platform play I mean our healthcare platform uh, Triseto has two-thirds of the insured population mm. of the United States is on that platform so I'm going to look for um, M&A activity either on platforms okay. industry domain 
or um, gaps in geographies where we don't have a presence. Okay. You know, we are a, we are a little more dominant in the U.S. Seventy-five percent of right. our revenue comes from the U.S. So I am under-indexed in uh, in other parts of the world. So we could fill the gaps using that. Equally. Uh, we have a huge presence in healthcare and financial services, mm. and we have a lesser presence in other industries. We could fill the gaps using that as well. So it's a strategic tool. I'm going to, I'm going to use it as needed. You know, you talked about uh, the cost saving that uh, you hope to accrue on account of downsizing your real estate as well as the layoffs that had been announced, about 3,500 that you announced in May. Are you done with that, or do you believe, given the environment, more will need to be done in order to protect margins? So we... Uh, we made that announcement last quarter. We start. We have, we have made some progress this quarter. That will continue for the for this year. Uh, I made a conscious call to only look for structural shifts. I mean, structural shifts of uh, of cost will never. You know, hopefully, won't come back. Uh, so the two things I'm impacting is the uh, one percent of the workforce, the 3,500 people we spoke about. That is related to non-billable roles mm. and we are also right shoring some of those roles I mean we're right shoring to places like India and these are roles which are not on projects this is this is not people who are on bench these are these are non non mm. uh, non-billable roles the second is my own personal belief has been that uh, in in India 40 to 50 percent of the IT workforce has moved to tier 2 cities during the pandemic mm. And the social fabric of India is in, designed in a way that people who, uh, you know, before they have families, they actually live with the parents. Mm. So they've gone and lived with the parents. They're, it's a convenient model. Yeah. And they have not come back to tier one cities. And I think the social fab, you know, looking at the aspect that flexibility cannot be at odds mm. to productivity, mm. we think we can move work to where people are. So we are actually going to move a lot of that work to tier two cities uh, uh, and hopeful that we can tap into that pool, mm. retain more, gain more talent, and in the process also save costs. Mm. Uh, and I also believe that 100% of my workforce is not going to come back to work. So a combination of moving to tier two cities and not coming back to work, we're shrinking 80,000 seats. I think we'll have enough to continue our work. And as uh, that savings is plowed back, there is elasticity in, 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 in the way we do work. I mean, our sales, our SGNA costs yeah. don't go up along with revenues linearly. Yeah. They don't go down linearly with, with revenues. So I'm hopeful that some of that I can, uh, I can use it for growth. Mm. I've only, uh, uh, I've only um, announced that uh, we're only going to do 20 to 40 basis points on our margin expansion. So I have a lot of cushion to keep that kitty with me to use it to invest on growth. So that's my endeavor. You know, speaking of investing in growth, uh, uh, the AI bet, and I know that uh, you know, you've started work on that uh, over the last few months that you've taken over. Uh, what is that potentially going to mean for you? How do you intend to sort of absorb uh, this opportunity at this point in time? And the second, which is the challenge that the board has thrown your way, which is to diversify and bring more women uh, across the uh, ranks and file of the organization. How do you intend to deliver on both? You know, uh, Shireen, you know, I, I fully agree with my board that, uh, w you know, uh, growth lies in heterogeneity. And heterogeneity will come with a diverse workforce. So I'm fully committed to making Cognizant a very diverse, inclusive. We are otherwise a diverse, inclusive uh, workforce, but we want to do more. We want to make that a differentiator for our employees and of our clients. Uh, a variety of ways to do that. You know, our hybrid work is going to embrace more women at work. I mean, we, we do believe flexibility is not at odds to productivity. Mm -hmm. So giving that flexibility will allow women to uh, be in the workforce more. We have a large pool of uh, women at the bottom of the pyramid. How do we actually traverse them through the, through the journey and don't lose them on the way? There are a variety of uh, techniques which we are applying on our work, workplace. Top down, we have matrix for our leadership including the board and the write down including myself mm. we have metrics for the board that our executive leadership team has to have some percentage a percentage increase in women uh, and that is not just me the next 300 to 400 leaders in the company have those goals we are also looking at ways to go to the adjacencies of our industry mm. to bring women back 
one of the things I'm very fascinated about is uh, women who have left and who want to come back. We're almost opening up a green mm. channel for them. Mm. So there are a variety of ways to do that. So coming to your question on, uh, so we're very committed to it. We, we think it is going to help us significantly mm. in the products and services we build in the market. Uh, we do believe that we have the infrastructure, the mindset, and the culture to do it, and that could be a differentiator for us. Now, coming to AI, uh, it's a fascinating conversation. Uh, you know, the, the narrative has gone all the way from literally in three months from what can AI do to yeah. AI will save the world to AI will destroy the world. I do believe AI is going to be the biggest uh, discontinuity in the technology space. It's going to amplify human potential. It's going to take away jobs of the past, but it will create significantly more jobs of the future. And that bridge it can, can only be built through reskilling. Mm. And we are at that cusp of it as a company, mm. and we could completely capitalize on this opportunity. So, you know, th sorry to sort of interrupt, but what will it mean in terms of things like pricing, for instance? Yeah. Uh, you know, d does it help? Uh, so I'll, 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 quickly, I'll quickly, you know, kind of uh, dissect this into two parts. On our business model, we have a pyramid with the bottom of the pyramid doing a lot of repetitive tasks. So when AI comes in, there is this notion that the pyramid will break. And what happens to people who have lesser mm -hmm. skills? My own philosophy is a smart engineer will always use the tooling and instrumentation even if we don't subscribe to it or we don't, uh, we don't uh, consult with them. An average engineer wants the organizational infrastructure to have the tooling for them to be very productive. 30% of the code even today is written by AI. So we think as we, as we make engineers productive, we can create upward mobility in their jobs and take the non-productive jobs and take the repetitive jobs to uh, machines. Uh, the second big shift for our own model so we make more productivity. Mm. As we make more productivity, you know, I'm hoping that we could create more prosperity and more upward mobility mm. for our employees. The second shift I would believe is if AI is going to take problem solving, and problem solving is how you know, workplaces were built since the Industrial Revolution, problem finding the new big endeavor for mm. humans will come from a cognitive diversity. We think we should hire um, disciplines much beyond STEM, like liberal arts, uh, you know, design, anthropology, sociology, psychology disciplines, which will allow us to create that amplification of machines and, and humans working together. Mm. So that's what happens to our business. Our clients' businesses, we have wonderful number of opportunities. I mean, uh, you know, the large language models or the foundation models, which are run by the big tech companies, they're not production grade. You need a lot of heavy lift. That heavy lift will come from fine-tuning the model mm. and that heavy lift will come from adding judgment to the prediction of the models. I mean, I'll give you an example. If it is, um, if you're asking an AI model to predict a percentage of rain based on data, it will probably predict percentage of rain based on data. It's not going to tell you mm. whether you should carry an umbrella. umbrella. Yes. That will only happen yeah. if you are able to feed context. Yeah with a set of human specialists, I mm. mean, mm. or uh, specialists who can, who can train the model. I call yeah. them the reward function engineers, <laughs> uh, or prompt engineers, as some, some, yeah. some call it. And that whole thing, that whole heavy lift will be done by companies like ours. The use case discovery, that heavy lift, making AI more responsible mm. so that it becomes production grade, so that it can amplify human potential. So, you know, I'm excited about the productivity lever it's going to give mm. to our clients. I would believe our clients will go through a re-engineering. I mean, large enterprises will go through a re-engineering. And that wave of re-engineering will be powered by AI, and we will handhold, orchestrate, and uh, partner with our clients to do that. So the opportunity is only more than, uh, than before, and therefore I'm excited about what it does to tech services companies. We have taken a head start on it. We made an announcement of Neuro AI a couple of uh, mm. weeks ago. So I'm excited about what it does to my model, mm. as well as what it does to our clients. Well, Ravi, it's been an absolute pleasure. We look forward to seeing uh, uh, what progress you make on the measures that you've already decided to uh, to roll out. And we wish you the very best of luck as you take forward this journey. Thanks very much for thank your you, time Shari. here. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me. Well, that is it on this edition of On the Record with me, Shireen Bhan from all of us here. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.